Would you please, would you please stand and salute the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Just tried to join. Is, is her mic on? Is Pat's mic on? For YouTube? Okay. Pat, if I missed seeing Oh, Derek Bailey right now. Oh, I see Alex is on. Okay. My mic is open. It's on here. Here? Right there, that one. I think it's one. If you click on that, I think that's where it is on a Chromebook. I'm not sure. Nope. I don't even see where it is. Where's her? Um... <laughs> where is her speaker on the Chromebook? I'm just not sure. Okay, that was right there. It was right there. Yeah, it's off. Okay. So my microphone is off. It's off then. You gotta put it. <laughs> oh, okay. You got that. What happens when Scott's not around? Your call will be connected when you enter the pin, followed by the pound key. Because a lot of people are on the call. Can we only call. do that when we want to talk? Press star six to unmute. The call is being recorded. You unmuted yourself. Okay, we're good to go. Okay. I have a motion to uh, approve the notes for tonight. The agenda. Any discussion on the agenda? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Uh, Kendall. Open forum. You're up. Okay. Hi. Are ready, ready for me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I am here tonight uh, with the distinct pleasure of offering our congratulations on behalf of the district to two wonderful students who graduated last school year, uh, Bailey Capel and Alex Content, who have earned themselves the International Baccalaureate Diploma, which is just incredible. And um, I, I'm so lucky that I had a chance to be able to work with them in their second year of working toward achieving this goal. Um, they did it with grace. Uh, they, they were pretty incredible amidst the pandemic having to shift all of what they had thought it would entail to a virtual setting, and, and they did so wonderfully. They had to complete a community service project all through virtual. Uh, they had to complete all their courses in a, in a very different way from what they expected with exams being canceled, and, and they did it. And I also just want to mention how wonderful it was to see their team work together. Being uh, two students in this program together, they were able to kind of lean on each other and provide support to one another and really make the experience, I hope, a really positive one for each other, which is what IB is all about, that teamwork and collaboration. Uh, I was very lucky to be able to see the girls uh, in this past week just 
we got to go outside with our masks on and, and hand them their physical diploma, and it was so nice to see them, but it's really nice to recognize them in this setting as well. So congratulations to Alex and Bailey. Thank you. Good job, girls. Congratulations. Congratulations. Well, that's wisdom. <laughs> no? Can you share a little bit of what you're doing now and how the IB benefited you? Well, um, I can go first. So I'm studying at Binghamton University right now as a bio major. And um, IB helps me out a lot, not only giving me um, a lot of credits to go towards like my gen eds and my major, but um, it also really prepared me for school. And, um, you know, I'm realizing like I'm, I'm able to take notes a lot better and I'm, I'm more prepared for the workload. Um, and also like teamwork, like I've had to work with a lot of groups in school. And um, I think Ivy really helps me like learn how to work with other people. So it helps me out a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm Alex. Uh, because of IB, I am now studying in Milan, Italy. Um, I'm studying at an international school and I'm majoring in um, economics and management for the fine arts. Uh, without IB, I would not be where I am today. I would not have been able to apply to an international school. Um, I also think IB definitely helped me for the workload for my exams. I think definitely without IB, I would have been overwhelmed in the semester. Um, yeah, and going along with what Bailey said, it's definitely like eye-opening. It's helped me with group work, group projects, and really just working as a team, but also for preparing and studying. Congratulations to both of you. Yes. Good luck. Okay, open forum. BLT presentation, Brian, brief. All right, well, good evening, everybody. Um, tonight you're going to hear a little bit about the Middle School Comprehensive Plan or the CEP. Uh, we've heard about the CEP this year, and you know, we've been talking about this topic since last February. Before we get started, we'd just like to thank uh, Aaron Manning and Jim Hutchins from the BLT for joining me tonight, and then also thanking um, Ed Mackey, another BLT member, another teacher representative Sue Hollywood, who helped work with the plan, put this plan together, and, and get a lot of the data um, after school and, and in the evenings here in November and December. So tonight, real quick, and real quick, similar to the, the BSEP you heard in August, you know, we really created a, a building plan that aligns with the district goals and you know, the plan that we are, want to put into action, you know, we know are some long-term changes, you know, and that was important for us as to go through this. Yeah, Mr. Hill. <clears throat> so you've seen this slide before, but just real quick, just kind of where we are in the process. Um, you know, last February we started talking about some of this when we were identified for our subgroup in middle school for our special education students. Uh, the DSEP plan was something we worked on throughout the summer, uh, and then it led to us doing site visits here in October in our building. The final report was uh, reviewed with myself um, and Superintendent Nancy Andrews, who then presented after that final report to you in December. 
to recall from there. And from that report, the DLC, as this Aaron and Jim can allude to also, was something that we really took, looked at that seriously, and tried to put a lot of things that were brought out from that site visit um, into the plan, and I think you did receive an in-depth in -depth copy of the plan, um, to the point where we did submit the plan, and then now we are at a point of starting action. We actually have started some things last week. We actually had a pretty a great meeting this afternoon um, as we're starting to put the actions on the timeline and that plan that you saw uh, into place here. <clears throat> and Jim and Ken, I don't know if you just wanted to add anything a little bit about just some of the planning at all or not. You don't have to. I know we talked a little bit about this, but. Sure. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, so for the planning, we really had several hours that we worked together, many evenings. Um, between meetings, we were able to go to our colleagues, get their input, come back to the meetings to, to develop this plan. And as Brian said, we really hit the ground running first day back from Christmas break um, at a faculty meeting. Brian introduced and, and presented this plan to the faculty and now we are starting to work in small groups to collaboratively find a way to complete these goals over the next several months. Thank you, Karen. And um, just to add on to what Karen said, and good evening, by the way, um, what was, it was a truly collaborative thing, um, process that we went through, and there was a lot of time spent on um, trying to figure out the root causes of things. There was there was a good deliberative process to go through where we didn't just jump to trying to come up with solutions, but first we spent time um, thinking of what was actually causing the issues that we were seeing, which is a much better way to go. It's, it's less of a solution looking for a problem that way. So I'm, I'm hopeful that um, the steps we're gonna take are gonna down the road make a difference. <coughs> And for all of this time that our group put together, it was several hours, um, Brian Reeve really did do a lot of extra work, and we appreciate what Brian did to really capture the spirit of all those meetings we had together. Yeah. Thank you both there. So diving into it, our first poll here. Um, so we had to have create five goals. We did, we did ELA, a math, uh, a survey goal, social emotional learning, and chronic absenteeism. So our first goal, the ELA goal, you know, was one where we took a look at how could we, in a year that's maybe a little unknown still of, you know, last year's assessments were canceled and whether they'll be happening this year, we don't know. But one thing we do know is that we did have our standardized tests our eye ready. And so that's something that we really focused on for this year. <clears throat> and we looked at the 2018-19 data from eye ready, uh, and, and we are going to be comparing it to the data for 2020-21 here this year. Um, we didn't look, we're not looking at the 2019-2020 data because we did not do the third uh, round of iReady last spring due to us uh, being leaving school in March and being home remote. So looking at data from 2018-2019, we looked at all students 28-19 and 52% of the students made typical growth. And when we talk about typical growth, we're really talking about the average annual growth for students at each grade level. So we may have some students when they take the test, particularly our, our, our subgroups who might not uh, be at grade level, but are they making typical growth in the year? And that's important. They need to be continuing to be moving forward. So <clears throat> when we looked at the data in 2018-2019, only 52% of our students made typical growth. And so that was... 257 students took the test that year, and so 133 of them made typical growth. We felt for, excuse me, for this coming year, uh, we wanted to increase that to 62%. Uh, so it would be, we're looking at hopefully 161 of our students out of 267 this year who did take it in the fall here, and who we're going to be doing our next round of the iReady here in the next week or two, and then we'll be doing it again in the spring. <clears throat> With our special education students, we were looking at increasing from 36 to 56%. So the 36% represents the 2018-2019 data, and that was basically 12 out of 33 students that year met typical growth. 
for this up this year in 2021 here in the spring, we're looking to get 56%, which would be we had 41 students who did take it in the fall here. And so we'd be looking at 23 out of 41 make me in typical growth here uh, in the spring. So that's our goal here. So how are we going to accomplish that goal and kind of what led us to creating that goal? So looking at some of our root causes, one of the things we realize is that, <clears throat> you know, we, we really don't have a, a standards-based systematic writing process in our ELA classes. We have a lot of great things going on. The standards are being taught, but we needed more consistency from grade level to grade level in terms of just scaffolding and building upon each the, the skills that are taught each year um, and that we have a common language. There's not consistency with literacy skills at each grade level. And we also looked at that as like, what are some consistent things we can be sending out to our other content area teachers? How can other content area teachers help with literacy skills? We know it is occurring some, but how can we be more consistent with that across the building? Underutilized special education teachers and teaching assistance in our classroom. So we do have consultant uh, ELA and math classes where special ed teachers are in the classrooms. We have teaching assistants who are providing curriculum support in science and social studies. So how, do, how can we be utilizing them better in the classrooms with instructional strategies in terms of providing maybe some more differentiation? Um, so again, you know, that was a concern that came up when we were looking at root causes. Looking at our RTI labs, uh, again, providing some more consistent uh, processes for how we can address individual skills and needs. And then those, the last two there, the students are not taking the IRA in the state ELA state assessment seriously. And we, we can tell, especially with IREADY, IREADY will flag students who rushed or things like that. So that's nice about the IREADY. But then also, and this has been a problem we've had for years, uh, the state students are opting out of the ELA state assessments. So those were definitely root causes that led us to form that goal. Some of our action steps we started to look at, and this a lot of this came from, again, looking at that final assessment report. So again, listening to uh, what administrators and our outside consultant, Nancy Andrews, saw, uh, listening to interviews that were conducted with teachers, interviews with parents, interviews with students. Um, and that's where we create a lot of our action steps. You know, the posting of objectives and agenda in all classrooms. You know, this is something that you, you see it here and there, but we need it consistently so that students know what they will learn and why they're learning it. Having some meetings with various stakeholders, and particularly the ELA goal would be our ELA teachers, our special education teachers, different administrators, and we're also really utilizing our Star um, specialists, uh, Karen Cole for ELA and Melissa Mal Malcuso for special education. And they actually led one of our meetings here today, um, meeting with our ELA and special ed teachers. <clears throat> so again, we know that we need to, if we're gonna make some changes with creating a writing process, we need the input from our teachers. We need to create something that we all feel like we are planning together uh, so that there's buy-in from everyone. With the literacy, science-based literacy skills, again, using our ELA and special education teachers, um, how can we, what are the skills we're seeing really tapping into our special education teachers, the skills they're seeing that some of their students are lacking and how that could be supported more in the classroom, but also so that more is happening in, in the actual resource room itself. And then also, how can we then create something to help other area teachers that do reading and writing in their classroom, whether it's in science or social studies or health class, and how can they support some of the literacy skills that students do need. We will be working with our, our lab teachers in our RTI classes so that we can, again, work with them to create a consistent process across the grade levels. Um, also to really utilize our iReady individual instruction um, that we have for each student that really tailors things to their needs based off their test results from iReady assessments. Working with, again, our special education teachers to really look at research-based uh, instructional strategies that can be used in the classrooms uh, for special education students. So again, talking to them about what are some of the strategies we're already using, how can we fine-tune those more, how can we, maybe there needs to be some more PD with some of our other teachers in the content areas, 
But again, trying to get to the root cause of things that we wrote down here and figuring out how we can improve upon that in the classroom. We're conducting walkthroughs. This is where we're really, <coughs> excuse me, as administrators looking to get out into the classrooms more. It is not an evaluative thing, but more just to make sure we're getting more of a pulse on what's happening in the classroom and seeing students engage, particularly special education students, and what are some of those instructional practices that we had discussed together and looked at, you know, how are they now being implemented in the classrooms. We also, the last two there, talk about, and we've done that, we haven't done this in a couple of years, uh, but we've had in the past, like, coffee hours with parents to, start to discuss standardized testing, why are people opting out, um, you know, it's time again to sit down and have some conversations with people again, whether it's a regular, something outside of a PTSA meeting, go to a PTSA meeting, um, but also talking to our students, you know, the plan is to go in and sit really talk with students about this. Why, you know, what do you not understand about standardized testing? What is, what makes you not want to be motivated to do well on it? And so again, just having some really diverse conversations with our students, you know, and again, this was an important root cause because in 2018, 2019 for ELA, across the average across the grades, we had 57.3 of our students opt out. So again, it was important that that was put into our ELA goal. <clears throat> what our math goal, so you're going to see some similar repeated things with the math goal um, because we kind of felt a lot of the same things, um, but the goal for both our, you know, all our students are special education students with the same percentage increase because ironically the numbers were it pretty much, it, it's much the same when I looked at the 2018-19 data. So you have 133 out of the 257 students in 2018-19. And again, the same was um, for our special out of 36% of 12 out of 33. So we're looking at that same increase of, uh, you know, 10% for all students, but 20% with our subgroup. So one of the root causes, though, again, so, you know, why did we come up with that goal? So finally look at things, data, and talking, and listening to our teachers and looking at the final assessment report, one of the things that came out was students are lacking basic fluency skills. And one of the things when we talked about it was is that there are parts of the New York State assessment or parts of the iReady uh, assessment where students can't use calculators. And the retention skills of some of our students from year to year is really lacking and causing students to struggle. Um, and teachers are seeing this every day in the classroom itself. So, I mean, it's kind of firsthand in their face type things, uh, they're seeing students struggle with some of those basic fluency skills. Again, we heard this the LA goal under utilizing special education teachers and teaching students to concentrate assessments. So again, how does that look maybe there's probably some similar strategies across the LA math, but there might be some things that'll be a little bit different in the math. But again, that'll be really sitting down with our special education teachers and just talking with them. Uh, there's, again, with our labs, trying to be more consistent with our process, our labs for individual, addressing individual skills. And then that, for the last two, again, students taking the assessments or the already uh, seriously, and then how can we address the opt-out rate. Acting steps. Again, we're looking at some similar things, uh, posting objectives and agenda in all classrooms. So again, students are understanding what they will learn and why. Again, meeting with different stakeholders, so again, our math teachers and, and our special education teachers, uh, you know, to research, discuss, review some of the math critical concepts, and really come to consensus with uh, standards-based skills that will be reinforced in grade six or eight, and how they will go from grade level to grade level. And one of the things, going back to the ELA and time with the math, is, is our goal throughout the spring is, again, to really look at some research look through materials, try to figure out, looking at the standards, and coming to an under consensus of what we feel is going to help move our students forward, and then we are trying to finalize, if you had looked at that plan, doing some work in the summer here to wrap that up. And we really feel many of the things we're doing, particularly with our math and LA goal, are really going to lay the, uh, not only will we be addressing some things this year, but it'll also really lay the foundation for many of our steps for next year as we'll be looking to create a plan for next year here in the next upcoming month. 
back to our action steps here again. Um, looking again at collaboration with our special ed teachers on some research-based instructional strategies. Again, that will help support in the content area classrooms our special education students on a regular basis. Again, looking at how can we provide some more, you know, skills-based instruction within the classroom, but it's not necessarily always done all the time in the resource room too. Um, again, conduct walkthroughs. So again, trying to see in our math classes how are students being engaged, how are they uh, differentiation, differentiating things throughout um, if there's a need for that in those classrooms. And then again, meeting with our parents and our students to again discuss standardized tests and uh, with, uh, with math. So this would be something we would definitely combine together. So if we have an evening or talking to students, it will be something where we'll talk about both math and ELA together. And again, our opt-out rate for our math was just a little bit less than ELA, but was at 54%. Our next school um, one. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm gonna say, before moving on, I have a couple of questions, if I may. Sure. Um, first, is, I don't recall, to what extent, when you get the assessment data, where you, you see, um, where there, there is a need to address the potential issue or, or improve um, the skills in the certain area. To what extent is that also communicated back um, to other buildings? And this is maybe not just for you, but this could be true of high school communicating to you, you communicating to elementary school. Because I would think that if you have, say, a sixth or seventh grader, grade rather, that is underperforming on the test that is relevant <laughs> to the elementary school, you know, you know to, to kind of inform their understanding of how um, you know, they're teaching at a certain point in time, how effective that was. So to what extent does that communication happen and how useful is this, you know, in practice to happen? Well, we can, with the iReady, you can go back and look at previous year data on students. Um, you know, also with um, Mr. Hash, kind of the K-12 RTI coordinator, he is across all three buildings working um, at the RTI level, so he is also helping to communicate to us things that are, whether it's individual students and bringing that data to us from year to year, um, but also just, you know, where are things, boom, I guess just backtrack a second, also looking at what are, one of the things we did discuss was how are, what are some of the things that are happening at the elementary level that we either can kind of support too? And so for example, the fluency things, um, and I don't know if I'm, if I'm going off on a tangent from your original question, but with the fluency goals, one of the things was is that, you know, right now elementary is using a program that they're finding to be pretty helpful with their students. It is something that will align that, that we're, we're looking to use and pilot this spring with our sixth grade, but also, this company also has another uh, program that works with our seventh and eighth grade too, that we are looking into trying to get a, be a part of too. Um, so again, going back of yes, are we looking at data from previous years? Yes. Um, I know just the other day we had a high school teacher who was wanting to look again at some of the iReady data from our eighth graders last year that went into ninth grade. So there is data there that people are able to look at. Um, you know, the assessment scores are always in school tool, not that we had any last year, but those are there for teachers to look at from year to year. And of course, people can reflect back on a student's grades and actual classes too. Is that getting to where you're at or not? I'm not sure if I'm answering you correctly. I think it does. Thank you, Brian. And then my second question is, the extent that basic, you know, fluency and basic skills is, in, is identified as an issue for math and also ELA, um, a couple, you know, I think there's a couple of points there. One, with the use of calculators, that the calculators aren't allowed on certain standardized tests, and that potentially is um, an issue because students are used to relying on calculators. What about something as simple as saying, don't rely on calculators in your day-to-day -day classes? You know, of course, I would think it's going to um, you know, do longhand the basic math skills and reinforce and support those. And similarly, with ELA, you know, what about you know, more spelling tests, more writing assignments. Again, things are really 
reinforce the basic skills that the students need for competency. Yep. So, I mean, that's why we're actually, you know, starting the meetings that we started one today where we really tried to brainstorm what are some of the things we're seeing in the classrooms and the lack of things we're seeing in the classroom. And that's where we do need to look at, okay, what will what can we do different that will help with those fluency back? Is it in the classroom, you know, like you were saying, have them work out some more of those long division problems or things like that so that they are practicing that. So that is what we're going to start looking at here uh, this spring and really trying to dig even deeper than the initial root causes to figure out what we feel is going to be successful to address some of these needs. So I don't have a set answer on that at the moment. Okay, I, I appreciate that. I mean, it's, you, I, I don't want to overstress the boundaries here, but I would just think that, I mean, for some reasons, I, I would have a concern if there isn't an adequate focus on those basic skills, again, being on the basic math without a calculator, how good it is, you know, students' spelling ability and writing ability, and those, those really those skills, and just really being certain that from in 12, you know, every year they're getting enough of each of those, you know, enough work area in each of those areas that <clears throat> basic skills they need right. for other achievement is um, right. Kind of. No, and that's why I think the, the math fluency thing came up as a root cause. And, you know, in our in our meeting we had today from with the and special ed teachers, the thing that came up was, again, talking about grammar. And, again, so, yeah, some of the basic foundational things that we've got to make sure students are consistent with. So, again, I think more to come out as we go through the spring of how we're going to try to address that and address that on a consistent basis um, year to year, but, yeah, also trying to align with the elementary. Um, too, as they are trying to address these skills too, and then how does that carry forward to the high school? Brian? Yes. So um, it's Tracy, I had a question. And let's say, for example, the ELA or the writing, do you envision this going across different subjects so that there would be, for example, opportunities in science? to have writing assignments and similarly yeah. in social studies so that the, I don't want to say focus, but the execution is not just concentrated in ELA, but truly goes across all the subject matters to reinforce and practice does make perfection. Brian, can I step in a little bit? Certainly. Okay, so this is Karen again. Um, that was part of our discussion today when we had a meeting with our Questar specialist. Um, I could speak to the seventh grade team. Um, in science and social studies, they are reinforcing that capitalization and punctuation rules. They have to answer questions in complete sentences. Once our ELA teacher finishes um, her instruction on paragraph writing, then the social studies teacher will also pick up on that with the social studies writing. I heard today in the meeting that the same things are happening at the 6th and 8th grade level. And part of this process is going to be trying to really align what we're all doing because I think really good things are happening, but we have to have a more um, concentrated approach together to, so that we're doing the same thing <coughs> and saying the same thing to our, our students. Okay, thank you. And if I could jump in too, this is Jim Hutchins again. I would say this has been a focus of the BLT before the CSAP plan. For example, we had rolled out the word of the week. We piloted with the seventh grade first. This year it's grade six through eight. Every week there is um, an academic word that we then find different ways to refer to and use in class. Um, some of us wear the word on our name tag. Um, so there have been, you know, things with prefix and suffix posters up in the room. So this has been a focus for a while with the BLT, figuring out ways to support um, literacy ELA skills across all the content areas. And I, and I hope really, you know, by the, you know, the end of summer or into July is really to have some things, though, guidelines more or less out documented more or less a draft of some guidelines and of what what expectations are and what we expect across the grade levels whether it's in ELA or in the other subject areas of you know if you're reading you know an article 
on um, earthquakes or something like that, what are some of the things you can do to be supporting litter systems out there? So those are things. And, you know, one of the things probably about eight or nine years ago, we as a BLT had adopted closed reading strategies so that teachers were utilizing the same things for students to really break down an article by number and paragraphs and annotating. So, again, trying to get more, get stronger with that with our literacy and also our writing across the board there so we got consistent things. <clears throat> okay, moving into our perception goal. So again, every year, um, you know, the past five years, we've put out our perception survey uh, where we gather data from our students, from our parents, from our faculty. So one of the statements that's uh, on the, the parent survey um, is that my child's teacher helps me to help my child learn at home. Um, and we expect this upcoming year, the average parent target response to be 3.2 or higher out of a five point scale with five being the highest. Over the past, uh, four out of the past five years, I mean, 2019 was our highest year, it was 3.2. In 2020, it dropped last year down to three. We want that to get back up higher um, here this year. This is something that, again, this has probably been one of our lowest on the five-point scale over the past, you know, four or five years that we've addressed, not even just this year, but from the, with the BLT. Other years, we really are, um, our push the past couple of years has really been just to get more parents participating in the survey, because our survey numbers were low. Um, you know, this year, we're taking a little bit of different focus. Uh, and, and some of the focus is more listening to what parents had to say when they were interviewed in the site, uh, the site visit assessments. Um, and so root causes of this one we looked at was lack of consistency of teacher use of Google Classroom and school tools. So some teachers might use school tools more, some might use Google Classroom more. You know, where are our parents to go to look for how they can support their child with completion of whether some work or assignments and so there, it seems like there's some confusion out there amongst parents with that. And then also <clears throat> making sure parents or caretakers are up to date with in, of either have an account access to school tool or understand how to use Google Classroom. Um, we are finding just even with some calls recently that there's still some people who aren't signed on the parent portal, but they didn't seem to be aware of it either, which, you know, I'm so... How do we address those things? So some of the action steps we're going to be taking that we're going to be trying to move very quickly on here in the next uh, four or five weeks um, is, again, surveying our teachers, TAs, our aides on different issues they are perceiving that we may be having a Google Flashman school tool, and then kind of create a finalized document that, from the feedback um, from the staff, create a document, put it back out, but let them give some more feedback and then kind of create some consistent just expectations with use, using Google Classroom school tools so it's pretty it's consistent across the board for parents to be able to truly understand that for each, each academic class. Um, create some tutorials for Google Classroom and school tool for parents through videos and then maybe even have a reference sheet. Have a, a Q&A meeting forum kind of with parents, coffee hour to just have them ask some more questions. So even after we put that video out, if there's still some questions that we need to try to answer to help support people, um, make sure that we provide that support for them. And then, of course, in, you know, we're looking at hopefully in April to do our perception survey again with the idea of that by doing some of these things, we will help increase you know, the, the score, target score on that response and that perception survey. But that was something that did come up with um, in the final assessments when you read some of that from parents was just helping them understand the hybrid model more. And I think a lot of that really has to do with Google Classroom and where assignments are and how they can support their students um, in that. Sorry, I'm so good, Mark. I'm ready. Social emotional learning uh, was our next goal. So, you know, this is really, you've heard quite a bit about this uh, in August. Uh, from Brook Van Fleet and the SEL standards, you know, you will see that really our, at our building level one, we're, we're really 
kind of supporting and doing a few other things, supporting the DCEP and doing some other things to support social emotional learning in the middle school. Um, <clears throat> our goal after looking at, so if you had a chance to look at some of our action steps in the, in the calendar, chronological calendar that was in the, the, the larger plan, um, you can see that some of the action steps did take place already. Uh, so for example, in December, um, through uh, the DSIP plan, the PPS department did put out a survey to the faculty on social emotional learning. One of the statements on that was, I am familiar with the New York State SEL standards at my instructional level. So at the middle school, um, the average response on that overall when we averaged things together was 2.8 out of a five point scale. So our goal by June is to set that up at 3.5 or higher. Um, and what really is the root cause of this? And, and this is something that there really isn't an aligned <clears throat> SEL curriculum. Um, and that is something that was a root cause that we realized back in June when, the, when we met to start planning the DSIP plan. Um, and I think, you know, um, who are, there's also a PLC under the DSIP plan, an SEL PLC that really has gotten a great start on things for this year. Uh, I've done a lot of things throughout the fall and the start of the winter here that's going to put us in good shape by June. Um, and, you know, so some of the action steps at the middle school. So mindfulness, you know, is something that we've done the past couple of years. This was started by our school psychologist, Jenny Prella. Um, and really mindfulness is equips students with the tools to build self-esteem, manage stress, and, and skillfully approach challenges. So that occurred again this year in sixth grade. So it's an introduction where we start mindfulness in sixth grade. But this year we also added where um, Michelle Fisher and Kendall Fitz went into classrooms and did mindfulness refreshers with our seventh and eighth grader. So again, you know, they were taught mindfulness in sixth grade, but they went into seventh and eighth grade and actually went over some of the refreshers of, of what it, you know, what it um, makes sure they are equipped still with some of those skills. And the TPS department also created really a mindfulness um, bank of activities that teachers can utilize and it was shared out with them so they can go and pull out some activities that they can do in the classrooms with students. But some of them are very quick little couple minute type things that they can use. Um, our <clears throat> PPS department has been creating a student screener so that we can analyze uh, students under the of the SEL benchmarks. Um, I know they have been working very diligently on that and are just about how that and we'll be administering that to students here in probably the next two or three weeks. Again, we are looking to gather data from that um, and going down to one benchmark to kind of review and identify, gathering the data from that so we can then work on creating kind of a scope and sequence for our SEL for what will be taught, maybe some of the stuff this year, but going into next year. And so we are also looking at meeting with each grade level team and breaking down the benchmarks with them to see, okay, here are the benchmarks for kind of grade six or grade seven, grade eight. What are some things maybe you're already doing in the classroom? Um, sometimes people don't realize a lot of the things they do on a daily basis uh, when you actually start aligning them with some of the standards. But then where are there some gaps? And how do we address those gaps? Some of it might be through school counselors or school psychologists coming into the classroom and doing some different types of lessons with students that then teachers can support afterwards or Maybe there are some small things that are integrated into the daily uh, curriculum with teachers themselves. And then also there's the one goal down there, the no place for hate activities. Uh, Mr. Hash has done a great job with our character education PLC, um, and they have created some different activities for this year as we are looking to uh, become a school that's a no place for hate, similar to the elementary last spring. Um, you know, our first activity is going to be going starting this week. It's focusing on diversity and inclusion. So we're excited about that also. And again, thank you to Mr. Hash and that character of TLC. And then again, in course, with uh, going back to meet with the different grade level teams. So how are we going to accomplish this one goal of making sure our faculty is more familiar with the SEL standards is that the PPS department, um, our school psychologists and our two, two school counselors will be going into the teams and meeting with them a couple of different times, go to the benchmarks to kind of help go through them with them, but also help explain and, and educate them if there's some areas that they're not familiar with. So I think, you know, again, 
hospitals to, to Brooklyn Fleet and the DSEP PLC and, and the goals they've started. We're supporting those more in the middle school here. I think by the end of the year, we'll be in a very good spot with things, and that will continue going into the fall next year as we continue to address the social emotional learning of our students because we know that students' social emotional learning is in check, and hopefully there should be better results academically for students too. <clears throat> and then our last one uh, was the chronic absenteeism one. Again, and you've heard about this through the DCEP also, um, where in the middle school we're looking to drop to down to 11% chronic absenteeism from being at 14.7. Um, you know, chronic absenteeism is kind of defined as a student has missed more than 18 full days of school. And what were some of the root causes? And some of these root causes um, are already sort of being addressed. As we, as you remember, we, we are part of the, the programs we're doing with chronic absenteeism is through that rural school grant um, from Proven Ground that was started last, I'm trying to think maybe last January or so. Um, but again, reasons for students being chronic absence, um, they're not necessarily system, systematically explored or addressed. Um, when they're absent, there's definitely a lack of relationships so that the student doesn't have a good connection to school. And then just again, what are, you know, the lack of intervention to support students who are chronically absent. So from that, what were some of the actions, and we've started a lot of these actions already, um, the pilot program for attendance mentors. Um, we've really, we've had um, staff members who have volunteered to actually take on, you know, most of them have one student, some people have one or, you know, two or three students where they're, mentoring and meeting with them weekly. Um, and these students were identified <clears throat> for being chronically absent. I think we had a pool of over like 200 students, I think grade six through 12, and then it was narrowed down to about 100. And from there we had to then, uh, we, we randomly have been picking students. We put a letter out to them. Mr. Hash has been uh, instrumental in this as he kind of oversees attendance K-12 um, and really getting this program off and running. Um, I think going forward, it's gonna to continue to be a strong program for us um, beyond just being a part of the grant here. Um, you know, so again, this spring we'll be gathering more data from that to see how it's working, see what we can do to tweak things um, to make it even stronger going forward. And then of course, in the year, we're hoping to have some great successes and be able to celebrate those with the mentors and mentees. So again, it's trying to have those connections, getting students motivated to be in school, and then making them have some connections to school. As we know, that is also a very important thing for students to want to be here and want to, want to be successful. So just kind of coming back full circle here, um, you know, you can really see that our step plan really kind of aligns our district goals, and that's always an important thing as we look to focus things that we do in the middle school with the district goals because there needs to be alignment across the board. You know, and collaboratively, we really feel that we create a, a plan that will increase student, student achievement regardless of, you know, whether, of course, we are on a list or whether we're on that list or not. We also realize these are some things that we need to do. So, so thank you. And if there are some questions, please, I know somebody had some throughout. I appreciate the questions. Um, I don't know if there's any others. Well, I have some questions, Brian. Sure. This is Dave Finch. Um, uh, first of all, I appreciate, I, I, I honestly mean this, uh, look at this plan. It, it involves a lot of work. Um, I think you've done a lot of work. The team must have done a lot of work, and I, I, I believe there's a lot of work to be done. Is that, is that true? Well, with that last part, I'm there's, financial there's, hearing you. There's a lot of work to be done still. Yes, there is. We got a busy spring out of us. Yeah. Um, so a simple question first. Maybe Todd can answer this. Is I ready a platform that's uh, accepted by Stayed? If we're going to use that as a measurement tool, if we don't have <coughs> the state assessments, is that? Except is the the, uh, the data created through already going to be accepted by the state for this plan? For the purpose of the plan, absolutely. Okay. Consider local data that we utilize for the purpose of social media. All right. Thank you. Um, I, I 
I, I really appreciate this plan, um, Brian. It's, it's, it's thorough. Um, this morning, really, I, I thought that uh, my questions were going to center on three areas, and those areas are scope, relevance, and then workload. Um, I, I went through the the, uh, the district plan earlier this morning, and um, and then I looked at the scores. Um, the the that was presented in. I guess February, maybe August, uh, that, that generated this TSI. Um, so the scope question kind of changed in my mind because I thought when we were talking about um, those scores, and I remember even asking that if six or seven or eight or 10 kids had done better on the exam, we wouldn't have gotten this designation. And and I remember Todd even saying that um, we were alarmed that we were identified as uh, at a board. I thought we were a little bit alarmed that we were designated. And then Todd kind of eased our, our fears by saying it's, a, it's, a, it's in the middle school only and it was a subgroup. So that made me feel better. But the scope part, this, my, my scope concern was that um, this plan seems like it's changing a lot more than just fixing those areas that make make us not be a, a TSI anymore. Um, but I do appreciate the, the the plan now because my my concern about the scope changed because looking at the score, I think there's improvement that needs to be done everywhere. Um, so I, I can I, I can appreciate that it looks like, uh, and I still the plan kind of seems like it's way larger than the original scope needed to be, but then looking at all the scores, um, there's there's work that needs to be done. Um, my concern about relevance are, um, <coughs> is basically, and I have some questions on this is. Uh, I don't see anything in the plan that refers to remote learning, and I really don't think remote learning is going to go away. In fact, if one, someone wanted to be innovative, I think that they should figure out how to make remote learning a positive thing moving forward. I can see it being um, marketed as getting some homeschool kids to log in and, and, and join our school once more. And I can see it being used as an absentee platform. Um, but the plan doesn't refer to remote learning. Or are we just assuming that all of it is going to work regardless of where the students are? Regardless of whether the students are home or not, it will work. I mean, we need to address consistency with our, you know, our writing process. We need to have a more focus on what are some of the literacy skills that are going to, you know, be approached in the ELA classroom, but what can be supported in other content areas. And those things aren't going to go away whether a student is remote or in school. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> even, um, Brian, you alluded to this before, um, as far as being the plan being, and I don't mean to, um, disregard anything, but when I mean relevant, I mean how this plan relates to the current situation that our educational system is in, being remote, being hybrid, being in school one day and boom, all of a sudden you're remote. I'm worried about the scores. I'm worried about the lack of content. I'm worried now, it, it, since this is going on for so long, I'm worried about the lack of skills that our younger students are, are losing. Um, and I, I'm wondering how, and I, I said this in our December meeting, um, I'm wondering how relevant the scores that are going to be generated are going to relate to 18, 19 scores. I, 
Yeah, I mean, I think every other school is wondering that, too. I mean, it's yeah, not going yeah. to be, if there's state assessments this year, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. I mean, you know, and you, it, it, you're right. There's a lot that still relates to the pandemic back to March. Um, but I still think some of the things that we have put down here are going to be things that need to be addressed. Um, you know, in terms of whether it's consistent language, whether kids in sixth or seventh or eighth grade, they're going to hear some of that same language of paragraph writing. You know, it's, yep. maybe there's two levels that are doing it and one is not. It's going to be relevant in that respect. Uh, if, if I could jump in, Brian, um, part, part of our discussion when we were developing this plan was how were we going to measure our goals? And we very purposefully chose to use the iReady because that is a more frequent assessment that we've given to our kids, and it has, um, if you're talking about relevance, it has more um, data that we can measure. We chose, even though we're on this list because of the state assessment scores, we chose not to use the state assessment this year because there wasn't an assessment last year, and then we're really looking at a two-year gap of time that we're trying to measure. So I'm not sure if that's answering your question. We chose the iReady to try to make it more relevant, to have more data ready for us throughout the year. If there's a state test this year, I think we would go back to with our plan for next year to use the state test to help us measure our goals. Does that make sense? Yeah, I would I would caution about that because the scores on the state assessment might be they might be great, but. Um, they might be horrifying, especially if we continue with lack of participation. Um, and I, I do hope that, because I've seen that before, and it's a chronic problem all over the place, um, students op opting out of, of the state assessments. Um, a couple more questions. Or, um, I, I actually, back to that, though, Brian had said that they had, They've given the iReady assessments multiple times this year already, Brian. You did one in the fall. And We've done one in the fall, and we're due to do another one here in the next couple of weeks. Okay, I, I wondered if... Okay, so, and then Karen mentioned that that's going to be the measurement for this plan. Um, and I, I think right. that's... I think that's a great idea. We have to, like like the plan says, you, you have to... You have to do apples to apples. Um, Mm -hmm. um, my workload, um, coming in here today, actually, I was cornered by one of your, one of the middle school teachers, and he basically said that they're not happy, not happy with not being here, not, not happy with the way the situation is going and not happy with um, the amount of grading and, and workload that's changed because of the COVID situation. <laughs> Same as I uh, mentioned in December, um, looking at this plan, it's, it's extensive. It looks like a lot of work for um, people. I, I just w w would, would caution that I would prefer to have teachers focus on um, doing the best they possibly can with the students that they currently have in front of them um, while they're working through this plan. But the focus, I hope, is is on their on their work with the students. And that's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much for doing this. I, I just, I mean, one of the things last week when I when we spoke as a faculty going through the plan was, is, yeah, I am definitely aware of the time and trying to not overburden people. There's a lot going on right now, um, you know, and we've got to do that balance of this is what's being, you know, still required of us, unfortunately, through the state, um, but also being respectful of the, the workload that's upon our staff, too. Yeah. Um, if, I, if, if I could jump in and for a second, this is Jim Hutchins again as a teacher. Um, I mean, Brian did make that clear at the faculty meeting, but the things we're looking at addressing are real things that we need to address. And um, I think 
I think the teachers recognize that, and that automatically got some more interest in doing them because they are important things, the kind of consistency and systematic use of things, addressing absenteeism, addressing, um, you know, parents and, and teachers, and everyone being able to work together with Google Classroom and School Tool. I mean, those are all important, real things. It's not, some of it isn't so much adding to the work, it's just doing the work maybe differently or being more consistent about how we're doing it. Or Okay. If I could add to Jim, um, you know, being part of this process since last summer, the, the administrators are really trying to utilize faculty meeting time and uh, team meeting time so that, you know, we're trying to use what's already there. And this is really the beginning of the process. Um, we will be meeting again over the summer and then carrying this plan further into next year. And I'd have to agree that the things that we are trying to put in place are going to be beneficial for kids for years to come. It's unfortunate we're being asked to do it this year, but again, that's, you know, that choice was not up to us, but it will benefit our kids for a long time. Brian, this is Tracy. I have two questions. Okay. Are you finished, Dave? Okay. Um, sure, yep. Yeah. One question is, with the iReady platform, um, I actually think, Dave, it's been heaven sent because with the high opt-out, it actually allowed us to assess the situation and to have data to confirm that there were some issues. So the first question that I have is, are we able to cut the data so that we can look at the different subgroups the way that um, whether it's low income, the special ed, and um, minorities are the three key subgroups. Yeah, and, and, and Mr. Hash, if you want to hop in at some point, you can too, but we are able to pull different groups out. I mean, just even to get some of the data for creating the goals, I, you know, Mr. I gave Mr. Hash, because he's the wizard at iReady, um, the, the names of the students I needed data on, and he was able to pull them together so that I could get the, the data we needed to create those ELA and math goals. Dan, do you want to add anything else? Yeah, I'm sorry to say, we're doing, we're doing a lot of that work manually right now, Tracy, but um, if you remember that program class link that we had talked about maybe at the beginning of the year, that's that single sign-on system. It's uh, so students can just sign in once and they can have access to all their programs. They're actually we're working with them to get a lot of that demographic data put directly into iReady. Um, so we'll be able to pull reports directly on those different cohorts. So, you know, uh, it's something that we're, we're finishing up right now, thankfully, the size of our population for now. We can just list the names and we can pull them one by one. Um, but it's going to be embedded in our system. That's great. Um, and then the other question I have is for professional development on these different elements. Um, is that something that you have an idea of the specific professional development? Is that something that further along you'll be assessing? Can you talk a little bit about that? I, I think I lost kind of your first part of there. I, something with professional development for Relating to what? I'm sorry. So with professional development, uh, do you have an idea now about the topics, the type of professional development that you're looking to consider, or is it um, you need more time in order to determine the most efficient? I guess I'm just asking if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, I think a little of both. I mean, we do know and in the plan there, I think if you look at the work uh, we I put in there we put in there for July for the ELA and math was part of it was also kind of creating a kind of presentation to um, do you know for, uh, present to our staff right at the beginning of the school year of hey here's what the final work is on our writing process and here are some things we're going to be asked you this year and we're going to model some things for you in the past we've done that where we've had teachers who have modeled how to do closed reading on an article um, in front of the whole faculty so they understand that. Same with some of the skills. And then I, I see after doing a full faculty presentation, 
has been continuing to support that um, at the team level as we have members really kind of across each team that have been a big part of this plan too and all the ELA math and special ed teachers will be a part of creating that writing process or some of the fluency skills and scaffolding that's going to occur six or eight so they will be able to support that at a team level too whether we'll need some other professional development at this time i am not certain on that but in terms of how we're going to roll out the work we're going to do throughout this spring and wrap up in July, definitely in September, we know in order to kick off the plan for next year, we've got to then have people talking about what we put together. So, so that we're putting really those, you know, what is that writing process into action by the end of September next year? I mean, the ELA teachers will be kicking it off, but how can other areas support that? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Todd. I for, they, like I said, they were a big, you know, Karen and Melissa were a part of, you know, kicking off a meeting today, and, and they are, right, going to continue to keep supporting and helping us create this, our, our parts of this plan. So they are a big part of that that will help, too. So thanks, Todd. And, then one other and the, good thing, the good thing about having them kind of in our corner is they've walked other <laughs> schools through this process, and it's been very helpful because uh, it's our first time through it and they've been incredibly helpful. Yes, good point. some more questions thank you again um, i'm sure we'll we continue to provide you some you know updates throughout the spring here too so thank you thank you brian okay janet uh, we're going to do budget review okay so today i'm Presenting the rollover budget. Everybody should have received some uh, little packet. Uh, the rollover budget is used as a starting point for the new budget, making the assumption that we will keep all programming and staffing levels exactly as they currently are. We look at the previous budget and increase the items that we know increases every year. For example, salaries and related costs based on employment contracts, increases to BOCES contractual cost assumptions, health insurance increases, and retirement rates. For the purpose of the rollover budget, we have increased the BOCES costs by an estimated of 3%. Projected salaries are based on employee contracts. 
preliminary projections will be made based on step movement allowed by Triborough for contracts under negotiation. Employee benefits, we know that Social Security and Medicare have not changed. It is 7.65% of their gross wages. ERS and TRS rates have been estimated by each retirement system. Insurance costs we estimate to increase by 7% mentioned by our consortium. Our debt service payments, we know the actual amounts for the 21-22 school year. The other large factor we will be our state aid runs for 21-22 school year and then the tax cap calculations. Hopefully we will begin to receive estimated tax runs from the governor in January. As you know, April 1st is the deadline to adopt the state budget. For the 1920 state aid payments, we are still waiting for $183,198 from, from various divisions of the state aid. So that is, that is money that they're still withholding from us from 1920 that we still have not received. Jen, is there a specific reason that's not part, is that part of the, governor? the August, September freeze? Yes. Okay, all right. I know the governor said in a, uh, one of his speeches that they're not withholding anything, but they, yes, they did, are. they just haven't released any. Okay. So slide one, to begin, let us first review the 1921 1920 budget to the 2021 budget that we are now. The 1920 budget, there was an increase of $806,618 or 2.64% from the previous year. Our tax levy increased by $165,356 or a 0.98% from the previous year. The next slide is a 2021 budget. There was an increase of $879,000, uh, $397 or 2.8% from the previous year. Our tax levy increased $123,254 or 0.72% from previous year. Slide three, the rollover budget reflects an increase of $731,205 or a 2.27 increase from this school year. So I broke it down by administrative capital and program components. For the administrative component, component there is a 1.9% increase. That is the total of administration of the school, clerical staff, school board costs, central data processing, BOCES, admin costs, research planning, and evaluation. The capital component, there's an increase of 0.58%. So that is the maintenance and custodial staff, debt service, utilities, uh, facility costs, service contracts, maintenance and repairs, and general insurance. For the program component, there's a 2.65% increase. That is the salary and benefits of all teachers, staff delivering pupil services like the health, guidance, library, athletics, textbook, instruction materials, equipment, extracurricular student acti activities, which is the club advisors, BOCES program costs, and transportation. So as we start on the preliminary budget, budget amounts will be updated as actual start costs start coming in. And the next slide is just informational for you guys to remember and for the public to remember when all our budget meetings are. So this week I have meetings with all the principals and supervisors to go through detail line with them and what they've already submitted to me for the next budget. Any questions? What's the, uh, Ray Alvin, what's the increase with the uh, Board of Education to 11.64. Um, I reallocated um, a salary to show more of the salary in the 
Board of Education portion than in the central administration portion. Board clerk. The board clerk. Is the one salary. That makes it, it makes it look to the public like we're spending a lot more money. Yeah, I just, and I don't like that sleight of hand. <laughs> Did I hear you say you were paying us a salary? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just just kidding. So if you look at the central administration line. Where's my check? So some of that was a, is part of the, well, the board clerk is also the secretary to the superintendent. So I just shifted some of her salary more to the board because she was um, just. Because I asked her to because it wasn't been, hadn't been done accurately. No, it makes sense if, because definitely, definitely the clerk does have certain right. duties and responsibilities. Why? Put finagulers figure. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to call you the other. <laughs> Just wondering, thank you. Yeah. Is it worth putting in a footnote, though? So, no? <laughs> when we look back on it in three years, I always like to be able to reference it. <laughs> so if um, someone's screaming at me, I can go, oh, yeah, that's what we did. <laughs> I'd have to go back and look, but it hadn't been hadn't been calculated the same way over the years, and it actually was a small increase. And I said it should be at least the same increase of what the salary increase is. So that's how it first was flagged oh, okay. that it was not even showing the same regular percent increase that I knew. Well, I meant you got 20% school board and work. Yeah, we can look at what that calculation. If it answer is. your emails. Dave, <laughs> 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 in your hands. <laughs> See what I started. <laughs> Good catch, though. Well, I looked at that. I was going to, I was going to make the comment that we had the biggest increase except for one. <laughs> okay, and the whole sheet. And <laughs> my other question is, and I know this is hard to decide, but just put it out there. You get a lot. You approached a lot by the community about, you know, well, my kid's not in school. We're not doing this and we're not doing that. Where's my tax dollars going? So, was, I mean, I know we still got to run the show whether they're here or not. Well, they are here. I don't understand that, but um, I just figured put that out there. Yeah. Because the student you know, that's going to be the number one thing on the taxpayer. You know, well, we're not having soccer. We're not doing this. We're not, no sports. We have no school dances. That, you know, so. We are educating the students. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> And there Mr. Chair, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but it's hard to hear people in the room. I, I think people aren't um, unmuting themselves before they talk, and it sometimes sounds like um, some of the speakers are not close to the microphone. How's that, Jay? Better? Yes, thank you. Sorry, it's a mask. It was far away from me. But <laughs> okay, it's, it's, not just, it's not just you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Ed. Duncan, you have something to say? Nope. No. Nope. Okay. It said you raised your hand. It's no. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. You're welcome. I need a motion to approve the minutes from the meeting of December 14th. Ray and Tracy. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 I need a motion to approve the finance reports for the month ending December 31st. I have Duncan and Tracy. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. 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 I need a motion to accept the Committee on Special Education recommendations. Ray and Duncan. Discussion? All in favor? I need a motion to approve the personnel agenda. Okay, I have Tracy and Ray. Any discussion? Duncan? Or, why is Mary on tonight? I didn't hear the question. Why is Mary on tonight? Oh, because she, she passed her test and is reachable, and now she has a probationary appointment. She was under civil service as a provisional appointment. So congratulations to Mary. Okay. 
And <laughs> don't we don't we normally adjust the probationary date? I mean, why would we just start with this? Why wouldn't we? That's not? civil service. Pardon me. That's how civil service works. Once she becomes probationary, she then starts her um, pro her provisional appointment. Then becomes the same probationary period, even though she's been here. That's civil service. Okay. But she'll do and just. We can't adjust that. No, we can't no. adjust that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you talk? Uh, I, I can't you? hear what you're saying. Are you? Is your thing on? That's it. Maybe it's on, Ray. I think he's double tasked. Is this better? Yeah, I think it's just work it, work, talking through the mask tonight. Okay. I, so I, I, on, on my Google Meet screen, it just shows that it's muted. So maybe I'm. Uh, oh, no. We don't use those mics. We use the other mics. Okay. Okay. Don't worry, Duncan. Kyle will take care of that later. Thanks. Do we need to purchase more of those microphones, the little portable one? I can ask that. Okay. 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 Mostly, I can hear better, but it's okay. I'll, I'll be fine. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? All right. Aye. 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 I need a motion to approve the resolution to adopt the retention and disposition schedule for New York local government records which we have discussed before. All right, <coughs> another one. Dave, thank you. <coughs> uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 I think they were both at the same time. Okay. I need a motion to approve the tuition rates for 2021. Dave and Ray. Any questions or discussion on that? Um, I just had the on, I noticed that there's, it's an estimate, but I noticed that, let's say, for special education, it's like a 7,000 increase. Is there anything in particular driving it? A very long formula that the state um, gives to school districts, so the, the state gives it to us. So I looked at what, because this is an estimate, I looked at um, Last year's estimate was, it was it's only an increase of a few thousand, but this is the formula from the state. So it's a lot of things driving it, mainly salaries and benefits, costs. Um, it's based on your appropriation right now, based on what your budget is, and then that's when they start to get the actual cost at the end of the year that they then um, recalculate it to an actual amount. So these are the rates we use if we have a foster student and that we bill back to another district is what these rates are established for. But there's not one thing that's driving it at all. Okay. Is this tuition rate for one of our students going out or is this a tuition rate for This is what we would charge for someone okay. coming here. And not our intermunicipal agreements. These are just foster students. Our intermunicipal agreements, we do an actual cost calculation. Um, based on what the student is receiving for services in the specific classes that they're in. Okay, so right, because those are the contracts <coughs> that are then approved on an individual or a school basis. So then this would be for foster care or like who would, f what student would fall? If we have a, a student that's in foster care that is attending our district, but the responsibility of another school district, we will build back the district. Okay. Okay, thank you. Because we do not accept tuition students, except through those agreements. Okay, we need a vote. We need a vote, yep. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> I need a motion to approve the revised standard workday resolution. Tracy, a second. Ray, thank you. Any questions? Who does that affect? The tax collector. This was updated for the tax collector. Okay. It is for anyone under employee's retirement. The board approved it at the reorganizational meeting. And then the retirement system spoke with our treasurer 
and they needed to do a correction for the tax collector. All right. And it's what, how many hours is um, what counts as a full day for the retirement system to give a credit for a day right. is what this is for. Vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 I need a motion to uh, appoint membership for committees. Dave, I need a second. Tracy, thank you. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Did, you, did Eric vote? I did, yeah. Okay, thank you. I just didn't hear it. Aye. Thank you. I need a motion to approve a donation to the Greenville Central School District from the Greenville Educational Foundation for $2,543.17. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. We're going to talk about uh, rescheduling our leadership development, which was scheduled for January 23rd. Tammy? <laughs> so January 23rd is, is very quickly approaching with everything that's going on. We thought that it might be better to um, push this off maybe March. Um, April, it depends on what you want. This is another time that we can do some board le um, leadership work. We could have another speaker come in to talk with the board just to build um, the teamwork among the board and um, board development. So we're just trying to get your thoughts, what you would like to see, what kind of timeline um, you're interested in. So should we email you? Like what would be the best process if, um, I don't know, we have any ideas? Yeah, uh, this was always on a Saturday. Do you want to continue and do one on a Saturday? Would you prefer to do an evening? <clears throat> I guess that would be the first thing. And then, if there's ideas that you would like to see, I'm happy to. You know, we could have someone from school boards. Mike Ford is who came last time. Um, if you're interested in in seeing him again, or just work amongst yourselves, there's other there's lots of choices. Definitely Saturday. Okay. That works for me. All right. We usually do a Saturday morning is what we've right. historically yeah. done in usually Stones. Eight to twelve or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. It starts at five. When Mike was here, we call them scones Saturdays. That's actually scone Saturdays. <laughs> <laughs> we want to have enough time so that we could treat you guys definitely to some food safely. <clears throat> well, any suggestions can we can well, I'm just wondering out loud. Um, if we're going to need additional budget meetings I, at some point, I, I, I anticipate, um, sooner probably would be better than later, meaning not, not push it to April. Okay. Maybe sometime in March? That's fine. Sometime in March, right. yeah. Okay. The uh, annual Questar meeting is, uh, I believe, supposed to be scheduled for April, but it will be held virtually if anybody's interested. You don't get to have <coughs> any snacks or <laughs> little treats and appetizers. It's tentatively virtual, but yes. we'll know more as the time right. comes closer. Any topics for future meetings? Duncan? I'd like a, uh, a moment of personal privilege. Jay, can you hear me? 
I think he left us. Yes, Duncan, I can hear you. Okay. You can oh. put the mask back on. I'll be able to hear you. All right. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Over the holidays, I acquired a plot of land in ancestral Scotland. And with that came a proclamation bestowing upon me the title of Lord. Therefore, henceforth, I would appreciate being recognized as such, and I have the documentation to prove it, and addressed as Lord Mr. Duncan <laughs> or Lord Mr. McPherson. Don't all boo at the same time, please. <laughs> but to be more serious, I do wish, and hopefully I speak for not only myself, but for the entire board, in bestowing upon our administrators, our teachers, our nurses, our food service personnel, our building and grounds personnel, our bus drivers, our substitutes, our aides, and anyone else who I may have missed in this summary, the title hero. The latter part of last school year, and to date this entire school year, has called for extraordinary and exceptional dedication, adjustments, and just plain outright courage on the part of all of the above. Therefore, I offer the following, and I ask my fellow board members to approve this resolution. Resolved, the Greenville Central School Board Board of Directors recognizes the outstanding and courageous efforts of each and every employee of the district, as well as the many volunteers in the district who have performed their duties so bravely over this past year. We thank you, not only for our, ourselves, but on behalf of the parents, and most importantly, the students of the Greenville Central School District. Madam President, will you move the motion? I do. Is everybody in second? favor? I'll second that. Yep. All in favor? Aye. 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 And one last comment. This, this allows students, faculty, uh, fellow faculty members, administrators, to address Mr. Hero Reeves. That was a very good opening statement you had this morning. <laughs> or Mr. Geometry Teacher Evans, my hero. I don't like all the time you kidding around about things, but I really like you, the way you teach geometry. But you can't fool me. Pi R square, no, no, no. Pi R round, cornbird R square. <laughs> Duncan, would you send that to me, please? Yeah. I made light of some of this, but I know I speak for everybody on the board. It's been an amazing year. Um, really, just about this time last year, it was starting to peak, or starting to come on the horizon, so to speak, and we didn't even know what we were looking at. And we still got probably the rest of the school year, and God forbid um, that'll be the end of it, or God hoping that'll be the end of it, but you never know. And uh, I just, I really feel that it, we need to, and I'm glad we did, address the work that everybody here has done. Absolutely. The community is really proud. I mean, I've had so many, con I have, my next door neighbor is having a, a kindergartner who goes to, uh, who's going remote. And I, uh, you know, I, every, every now and then I'll say, how's it going? He's, oh, he said, Mrs. Richards. Now, I don't know Mrs. Richards, but evidently she's, she teaches kindergarten. Dupree. And he said, I can't, she's a saint. So they. Uh, Lori Dupree. I have uh, to give credit for the kindergarten teacher is Lori Dupree. Lori Dupree. Yeah. Okay, well, I don't know who Mrs. Richards is. Maybe she's another she remote teacher for upper grade. Oh, on upper grade. Okay, I thought she was still in kindergarten. Maybe I'm wrong. Any event, um, <laughs> whoever he, Mrs. Richards is the one he identified, but uh, he said she was she was amazing. So, anyway, thank you all. Thank you, Duncan. Okay. Anybody have any suggestions for discussions that would like to talk about? I do, Pat. Um, and first, thank you, Duncan, for that. Um, Pat, there are actually two items I'd like to request. Okay. Um, first, I, I've 
you were saying here, I've always thought that one of the most important um, fundamental skills that, you know, I'd hope students really develop in school is critical thinking. Um, I think it's very important for college and career readiness um, in and of itself. It's just, to me, a, a basic skill that I think is considered to be important. I, I think critical thinking, and particularly the ability to critically evaluate information, is even more important today given the um, how much everyone, myself included, honestly, rely on social media and other sources for information, and given the amount of misinformation and you know outright conspiracy theories that are out there, I think that ability to critically evaluate um, and maintain some level of skepticism about information is even more important. So what I would ask is if the principals could come back to talk to the board about how the, that soft skill is woven into the curriculum um, K-12, and also if there are opportunities to um, uh, emphasize more the critical thinking um, ability. And I recognize that everyone is uh, very busy, and you know, I, I what we were talking about before with being sensitive to the workload, I understand that this is something that can necessarily be discussed in one month. But I would ask if soon we could have a discussion about this. Okay. What's number two? Um, the second question is I also would appreciate hearing how um, the, the elementary, middle, and high schools have been discussing the extent to which teachers have discussed recent current events um, around the um, events of the Capitol on January 6th and um, anything else related to the action, either before today or anything, that, uh, even as the, the trans presidential transition runs down around the 20th. I just would like to understand how that's being discussed, if at all, in the schools. Um, you have a discussion about that at the next meeting. It may put this way, I'd like to understand how it's how the students are it to the extent the students are discussing it in the school context, you know, as as a current event and having the you know the, the, the opportunity for questions from discussion within the historical context. Or any other kind teachers might be inappropriate. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Pat. Okay, open forum. I'm on the YouTube. There's, there are no There's comments. Okay. Yeah, there are no comments there. Okay. All right. so, okay. Then I need a motion to adjourn to uh, executive session. Which after that we will return, but no decisions will be made and no action will be taken. Ray and, and Dave. Dave. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll just take a couple minute break and then we'll go. There's another.